talk a bit about evangelism here um, at East Preston in this, this community, uh, but just generally speaking, let's just ask God's presence uh, to continue to be with us. God, we thank you for meeting us early this morning and for breathing that breath of life in us once again. God, we just ask that you continue to be with us. And quite frankly, you've already gone ahead of us and prepared the way for us. We don't know how to do this without you. We're stumbling around trying to figure it out. But God, you can show us the way. Your word promises that you'll give us the words to say. God, we just ask that you be with us. Lead, guide, and direct us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Evangelism, evangelism, the basic definition for evangelism is that it is the spreading, the spreading of the gospel, the Christian gospel, by public preaching, which is what I attempt to do and others here, or by personal witness, by public preaching, and I don't want to say or, and or. <laughs> because if you're preaching, you ought to be witnessing as well. So public preaching and or personal witness. I'm going to say a few words about what it is, why it's important, how it's done, where we'll do it, and, and when. But I have three scriptures that I want to share with you. You can just keep your seat now. Um, stand in your heart, amen, in reverence to the, to the reading of God's word. But these are ones that I just want to use as foundation for what it is we are seeking to do in Jesus' name. The first one, Matthew 16, starting with verse 13. And it reads as follows. I believe this is King James. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? This is definitely King James. <laughs> Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Verse 17 says, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, or son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter. And upon this rock, Petros, which means rock, Peter, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And then I want you to also turn with me to Matthew 28. I'll read from verse... 16 to the end, 20. It's the Great Commission. It should be very familiar to us, or if not, Matthew 28. Great Commission to the church. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee. This is after the resurrection, after the appearances of Jesus. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All Authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, verse 19 says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. This is Jesus speaking. And lo, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And then our third and final verse that we'll lift up is found in Luke chapter 14. And I'll just read verse 23, Luke chapter 14, verse 23. I think I heard the baby say Luke. <laughs> Are we there? Okay. The master said to the servant, go to the highways and back alleys 
the highways and the byways, the highways and the hedges, and urge people to come in so that my house, God's house, may be filled. This is the word of the Lord. There is a handout I think the ushers have. I want you to just send that out right now. We have with our leadership since last year, our church meeting, some of you were here for that. We've been talking about the need to do church differently, um, to, to find new ways to tell the old story, to not compromise the meat of what the gospel is, but to speak to a generation that has indeed changed. Many of us in here, I'm gonna ask for a show of hands, how many of you grew up in church? Your parents took you, grew up in church, see? Okay, now you know, put them back up and then look around, okay? All right, we grew up in church. Uh, so we know church, if you will, and I'll put that in quotes because all churches are different. But we grew up in church, and so there are certain things that we have been taught, um, conditioned to believe and to, to know about and to experience. But there is a whole generation that did not grow up in church. God's children, who are not members of churches, who are not part of a church, is certainly not the traditional church, but they are seeking after the same God that you and I seek after. And so what excites me won't excite me. You can sing Amazing Grace and I can get happy. But I do remember we just had a wonderful sessions at the convention with uh, Philip Yancey, the author of many books. One of the books he wrote, uh, is the name of it is What's So Amazing About Grace. There are some people who want to know what's so amazing about this grace that we talk about. We talked at that church meeting about the fact that there are words that we use. Some people call them secret codes that we use in the church and only we know. And all we have to do is say a part of it and somebody else says amen. But if it's somebody sitting there in the pew that didn't grow up in church and didn't know all of that stuff, it means absolutely nothing to them. God is so faithful. Uh, this past weekend, I was sitting in one of the sessions at the convention, and um, I go every year now, ever since I've been here, I love it, it was wonderful this year. But there's a time of praise and worship, and there's different forms of music, different forms of worship. And there was a time when they were singing a song, it was clearly a hymn, and I had never heard it before. And I was listening, I was trying to get the words, they had them up on the screen, but everybody in the whole assembly, and there were, there were close to a thousand there this year, they were up and they were in worship. I mean, you can tell they knew this song, they lived this song, they, they, it touched them deeply. Everybody, it was amazing. And I say everybody, just about, mostly everybody, except me. And it was one of the few times that I've had that experience in a worship service, and I didn't catch it. But right at that moment, God told me, this is how somebody feels when they come to your church. And they don't know those songs that y'all sing. They don't remember. See, I get happy sometimes when I remember songs that my father sang and they at home to God's unchanged. And I can just get happy all along, but they daddy didn't sing that. It means nothing. And I sat there and I wanted to feel what they felt in singing that song. But I felt nothing. But I know God loves me, just like he loved everybody else in that room, right? So what that tells me is that we don't just say, well, you know, whatever. You know, if you can't get it, whatever. I'm going to get my praise on. It tells me that God is calling us to do more to not just be at ease in Zion and get comfortable with doing the same thing Sunday after Sunday because we like it. Because somebody might be sitting there in that pew and they're not feeling what you're feeling, but they are desiring an experience with God like all of us. What she passed, what was passed out to you, is that just the article there? Okay. 
This was an article I read across. I actually posted it again on Facebook. And unfortunately, I apologize. I didn't put the author's name on here. But the, the, the title is Church, Here's Why People Are Leaving You. And it started off by saying you probably think people are leaving the church because, you know, the, Paul talked to us about the last times and how difficult it would be and people be lover of them, lovers of themselves rather than lovers of God and everybody's into themselves. It's all about me, selfish. You know, it's all about me. I look good. No matter how I look, I look good. <laughs> God, have you seen some of the selfies? But anyway, <laughs> Jesus. But, so, so we church folks just say they just, you know, it's just a sinful generation. They just gone. Gone to hell in a handbasket. I'm not going with them. But this article says, here's why people are leaving you. He gave five points, I think it was. First, your Sunday productions have worn thin. Now, this is talking about, you can read this later uh, at your leisure, but this is even talking about the more contemporary churches that have the big sets and the big, you know, the rock bands and all the lights and all the extra stuff. You know, um, I, I read an article one time where somebody said, nobody wants to see a 50-year-old pastor in skinny jeans. You know, that just ain't what people are coming to church for. But, you know, we're real relevant now. But he's saying that your Sunday productions have worn thin. And it says that people, people feel that they can be entertained anywhere. In fact, some of the younger generation have said, if I want a club, I'll go to the club. When I come to church, I want Jesus. Amen. So, so the answer is not to make the church just like the club. Amen. So he says your Sunday productions have worn thin. Sunday morning isn't really making a difference on Tuesday afternoon or Tuesday evening when people are wrestling with the awkward, messy, painful stuff in the trenches of life, the places where uh, rock, uh, rock shows don't help. Yeah, I, I even heard, I think it was at the AUBA this week, somebody was saying how good it felt in the assembly on the, at the last service. And it's like, this is like the old times. We need to go back to the old times. And I cringed because God is not calling us to go back to anything. Number one, we can never duplicate what has already happened. God is calling us forward to do things a new way without compromising God's story. The second thing he said is you speak in a foreign tongue. I mentioned that before. You may have noticed those who attend here regularly, we're trying, it's awkward, we're trying to change with our responsive readings because we recognize that the responsive readings that are in the hymnal are first of all mostly in King James language. It's language that we don't easily understand. It works well for some scriptures, but others it's very difficult. Also, the way these responsive readings were put together, it's a collection of scriptures. It's not just one complete uh, chapter or set of verses. And doesn't always make sense. And we don't want our responsive readings to just be something that you just read and then sit down and don't think anything about it. So what we're trying to do is use a more uh, contemporary version of the Bible and to use scriptures from a chapter or scriptures that go together. And prayerfully, you won't just read them and forget about them. We're putting effort into giving you something that is more complete so you can understand. Because there's a lot, it, we're used to, as Christians, we're used to speaking in foreign languages. Unknown tongues, I don't, and I don't mean the, the glossolalia that the scripture talks about, but saying things that we don't even know what it means. We just recite it and get through it. Every time we recite or hear or read the word of God, it needs to gain entry into our life. We need to be thinking about what God is trying to communicate to us. So, you know, we're trying in little ways, but we have to do so much more. We speak in a foreign language, and a lot of times, a lot of the words that we've used for years, for all of our lives, again, a person who just comes to the Lord or who does not have the history in the church doesn't understand it. And what do you do when you're someplace and you don't understand what they're talking about? Do you rush to get back there next week? No, you look for a place where they talk in plain English, where they get right down where you are, 
and talk about what it is you're really dealing with in your life and explain to you who God really is in a way where you can understand it, okay? Um, and there's more there in the insider language that we use. Um, and when we met on Tuesday and we talked about going door to door, it is important that we don't go toting a big Bible and ready to throw some scripture at people. Door-to-door -door evangelism is about engaging in relationship with people who are around us. And the truth is, we may learn more than we teach from those who might be right over here. And I, you know, shout at the church, but won't come here. There's a reason. There's a reason. And if we're not called to any place else, we are called to minister in this community first. And that comes from Acts 1 and 8. We'll look at that. The third thing is your vision can't see past your building. Hmm. I must say that we did very well this summer when we met at the rec center for some sessions. And we met in great numbers. I thank God for you that we weren't so tied to this building that it's not church unless we're in this building. We had some wonderful worship there. And I thank God for that. We need to do more of that. When we go out there and we're sitting outside and we, it ought, the spirit ought to be as high, not higher. Amen. If we need to meet in somebody's living room and we all on top of each other, if we love the Lord, it should not matter. Amen. If God blesses us in a way where we are able to build that church sooner rather than later, we better not start tripping about a building or we will lose it. Amen. Remember, God didn't call me to, to come here and help you build a church. He told me to build people. We have to be strong. We have to know what a building really means in the scheme of things. And unfortunately, what happens with new buildings is it becomes about the building. And everything we do is to maintain the building. While we're saying that what we want to do is have more space to minister to people, but we end up just trying to raise money to pay for a building, amen? So we, our vision has to be the vision that God gave us initially, and it's seen past the building. Again, you can read that. The fourth thing is you choose lousy battles. Oh my, I didn't write this. The guy wrote it and I couldn't have said it. We know, he says, you like to fight, church. That's obvious. When you want to, you can go to war with the best of them. He's talking about greater than just internally. The problem is your battles are too small. Fast food protests, hobby store outrage, I've heard about it, duck calling, reality TV show campaigns may manufacture some urgency and Twitter activity on the inside for the already convinced, but they're paper tigers to people out here with bloody boots on the ground. Every day we see a world suffocated by poverty, racism, violence, bigotry, and hunger. And in the face of that stuff, we get awfully, frighteningly quiet. The church is silent in those areas where it really matters, where the rubber meets the road, the place where the horses are that Jeremiah talked about. We wish you were as courageous in those fights because then we'd feel like coming alongside you. Then we feel like going to war with you. Church, we need you to stop being warmongers with the trivial and pacifists or doing nothing in the face of the terrible. That's an indictment on the church. And if you remember, Dr. Martin Luther King talked about the same thing back in his letter from the Birmingham jail. It has not changed. He said the same thing. And then fifth, your love doesn't look like love. Oh my. Jesus is love, right? And I hear people say all the time, what the world needs now is love. Well, guess where? If God is love and love is God, guess where love is supposed to come from first? God's representatives in the world, God's church. Love seems to be a pretty big deal to you, but we're not getting that when the rubber meets the road. In fact, he says, more and more, your brand of love seems incredibly selective and decidedly narrow filtering out all the spiritual riffraff, which sadly includes far too many of us. It feels like a big bait and switch. He says a sucker deal. Advertising, come as you are. Come, come to, come, come as you are. But letting us know once we're in the door that we can't really come as we are. See, as a church, sometimes we say come as you are. You know, wear your t-shirt and your jeans. But what we really ought to be saying is come as you are with all of your frailties and failures and mistakes and issues and everything and lay them at the altar. Jesus said that. Jesus said he would draw men. And he says bring your burdens to him. He will make it lighter. But as the 
at church. We say it because we know it's the right thing to say. Jesus said it. But then as human beings, we fall into that trap of looking over people who come and they're not the way we expect them to be. And it's sort of like a little sad glance. Mm -hmm. What's up right up in here now? In God's church. Mm -hmm. I heard the, the author say the other night that if you, if you read about Jesus and really study him, he wasn't attracted to the church folk, the rigid church folk. He hung out with the sinners. <laughs> he hung out with the folk who were in need of a healing and who weren't afraid or ashamed to come to him and say like the woman said, if I could just touch the hem of your garment. I don't need to be all wrapped around you singing all your songs. We got a big old Jesus uh, license plate and a bumper stick. I don't need all of that. If I can just I can be made whole. Yeah. Jesus said, oh yeah, that one. Who was that one? Disciples told him, a lot of people touched. He said, no, no, the one who touched me. Because see, when she touched me, virtue went out of me. It was clear to me that she was coming from her heart. She was real. She didn't throw my scripture back at me. She said, I yield, I yield. What must I do to be saved? God is calling his church to be the church in the world. We have to fight against evil, y'all. They're killing our babies. <laughs> killing babies. Yeah, you can look at them, you can judge them all you want, but nobody deserves to die a brutal death. The church has to stand up and be the church in the world. No, we don't go and fight evil with evil, but Paul teaches us in scripture that you fight evil with good. I, I, I have this picture I just found last night, and I reposted it where they have laid out all these roses in the place where Michael Brown was killed. They're like hundreds and hundreds of beautiful roses, and they were passing out roses to everybody, including police officers and cruisers, like only love, only true, pure. See, people think love is, is milk toast language, but true, pure, godly kind of love is what can transform this land. Jesus called both those who were oppressed as well as those who did the oppressing. He spoke, he ministered to the abused, but he also ministered to the abuser. We're all one in the sight of God. Our love doesn't look like love, it says. We say come as you are, but then we don't accept anybody who does it differently in our way. Then he ends it by saying, church, can you love us if we don't check all the doctrinal boxes and don't have our theology all figured out? It doesn't seem so. Can you love us if we cuss, if we drink, if we get tattoos? Oh, heaven forbid, there's a scripture for that. Vote Democrat, we're doubtful. Can you love us if we're not sure how we define love and marriage and heaven and hell? He says it sure doesn't feel that way. From what we know about Jesus, we think he looks like love. The unfortunate thing is, you don't look much like him. And then you can read on. He's saying you need to listen to us. We're the ones who are walking away. We no longer can point the finger and just say they're going to hell. They've got reprobate minds. No, no, no. Folk have choices today. Yes. Many of us didn't have choices. In my household, you was going to church. I didn't have a choice. But it's different now. But God is no different. God loves us all the same. And so we want to be God's church in the world. Amen. Amen.